Hey there, ladies and gentlemen. Hey there, this is your friend Charlie Hunter in Bellows Falls, Vermont, with my post-pandemic haircut. What a joy that was. If you haven't gotten your vaccination yet, get it. It's going to make you much happier, even if you don't think so. I felt a little nauseous for like a couple of, a couple of days, and that was it. And now I got a haircut, and I got my teeth cleaned. Oh, joy. Anyway, uh, it is good to, to be here, everybody. I thought I'd talk today a little about the creative process, not the creative process by which we generate ideas, but the, the fact that we are kind of at the mercy of our own creativity. Um, and this year, I was just tallying up, you know, I keep a database now. I use a system called Artwork Archive, which I like. I don't love, but I like. Um, and that listed, and so each each piece that I complete, I list, you know, I enter uh, in, in, in Artwork Archive. In January, there were 13 pieces. In February, there were 15 pieces. In March, there were a whopping 21 pieces I got done. In April, that plummeted to eight. And so far in May, we're at three, but I'm about to add a fourth. Anyway, the we're, we, we are both we are both creative artists and we're also small business people. And we have to manage ourselves. Uh, we are self-managed small business people. And back in the day, I was a music manager. And my job was to do all the left brain stuff for the, the musician. And the musician did all the right brain stuff. Now I'm having to do both for me. And I will tell you, the old manager is driven crazy by Artsy Charles. Artsy Charles is the most annoying human being, because Artsy Charles cannot just vomit forth painting after painting on command. Some days there will be a vomiting force of paintings, but other days there are not, not, not quite so much. Uh, other months, not quite so much. I just kind of wanted to take you through a recent, uh, kind of my, my, my most recent 10 days of creativity. Um, and I wanted to, to talk a little about the one of my favorite anecdotes about the idea of what constitutes generating ideas inside of oneself. Um, because I will go over to the studio and some days I go over to the studio and I know exactly what I want to do and I sit down and I start doing it. And then other days, there's just this kind of recharging of the well that goes on. And I think we, it's very important for us to let that well recharge, but yet our inner voice, the critical voice is telling us what jerks we are for doing that. And my favorite anecdote about this is a musician named Alejandro Escovedo, who is a wonderful Austin, Texas musician and my beloved down there in Austin, Texas, has toured with Alejandra Escobedo, and Alejandro has sung on some of her records. And, uh, and that here is Alejandro's website. But anyway, Alejandro was signed at like age 55. He got signed to, to Capitol Records. And Capitol Records, uh, you know, the, the, the world of major labels is very different from the world of independent labels. Independent labels, you just kind of finish your record and hand it in. The major labels, they get to say whether they hear any hits on there. And Alejandro, Alejandro submitted his record to Capitol Records, and they were like, we do not hear any hits on this. And so they call, They said, what are we going to do about that? And Alejandro and his manager, his manager is Bruce Springsteen's manager, John Landau. John Landau and Alejandro put their heads together, and they decided to call up Chuck Proffitt, 
who was in a band called Green on Red and Alejandro had written with before and it felt good, good chemistry, good simpatico styles of writing. And Chuck has a bit more pop sensibility than, than Alejandro does. And so they flew Alejandro out to the Bay Area from Austin. They flew him to San Francisco where Chuck Prophet lives. Chuck Prophet met him at the airport and said, we're going to get to work. And Alejandro said, yep, we're going to get to work. And they started driving back to San Francisco. But on the way, Alejandro saw a vintage clothing store and uh, they needed, he decided they needed to stop and paw through the racks. Alejandro's a very stylish guy had to paw through the racks of the vintage clothing. And then next to that was a store that sold scarves. And so they went in there and looked at scarves for a couple of hours. And then Chuck Prophet said, um, Alejandro, aren't we supposed to be getting going on doing this writing? And Alejandro said, well, what do you think we're doing? And so by which, by which I mean, the things that recharge our creative wells often appear very, very unproductive. I'll go over to the studio and I'll have snoggles with corduroy. And then I may flip through old typo typographic books of my father's. I may look at not very good photographs I took in the 1990s in Deerfield, Massachusetts. Or I may look at old family photos. And recently, the family photos started generating some ideas. And so, Betty Sue, why don't we um, start with the images? This first image was actually not a family photo, but it was from an, a uh, just a book of Ameri kind of Americana photos. And this is not at all a literal reading of what I was looking at. Um, it was basically a photograph of a one room of a barn that looked to me a lot like a one room schoolhouse that was up in Vermont when I was a kid that had been converted to a storage <laughs> storage for pesticides of the local orchard. Um, and so I did a drawing that used as its DNA kind of this, this Americano photograph, but it was through the filter of this, uh, the, the abandoned one room schoolhouse in Wethersfield, Vermont. And this painting was the result. This painting happened very, very quickly. I had a blank 20 by 20, which is a really nice size because um, it's big enough to feel like a statement and small enough not to be intimidating. And the scale of our hand gestures works very well on a 20 by 20. On a 48 by 48 or larger, you have to really be painting with your arm and unless you want to be incredibly precise. And the, 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 the gestures don't translate. What, what works working small does not work when you make that same small gesture on a much bigger surface. So anyway, I had this blank 20 by 20. Um, and I did, I very seldom do this, but I did a pencil, a direct pencil sketch on the 20 by 20 surface. And then with acrylic inks, um, Amsterdam, graphite, neutral gray and warm gray, I did the underpainting. One of my problems with acrylic is I tend to go too dark. And I find the acrylic does not have the luminosity that oil does. So the great thing about Amsterdam acrylic inks, the warm gray, neutral gray and graphite is they're not terribly dark. So the dark and I was diluting them quite a bit. So the, the, the darkest dark was really about a value three or four. Um, so this was my first pass with the acrylic ink and then I let that dry. And I think the same afternoon I went in with the oils. I might have waited till overnight, uh, but then it's basically, you can see on the right hand side is Van Dyke Brown providing the darkest dark, probably a touch of ultramarine to really darken it down. Uh, 
some burnt sienna for the, the reddish, um, and I think a little bit of yellow ochre. Um, but that's pretty much it. And there's a lot of kind of dry brushing on top of the acrylic and using a little bit of the um, Windsor Newton Artisan, which is their water mixable line, the Windsor Newton Artisan um, Safflower Oil, which is the medium I prefer because it isn't as ropey as the um, commercially as the Cobra painting mediums. Um, anyway, so I got this done. I let it sit for a day or so. I, I kind of put it away because it felt it kind of came right out. I wasn't planning on having this session. I wasn't planning on doing 20 by 20. It just sort of was there. I did it. I did not want to overwork. I didn't want to overwork the image. It really felt nicely in that kind of in the dream area. So I let it sit for a couple of days. And then I came back in and did one more session. And let's do the next slide, Betty Sue. Where you can see, I, I, it was a little too light side, dark side. So I did some more glazing and knocked it down, flip back, and then flip forward again, Betty Sue, so people can see the difference. So I didn't do anything more to the right-hand side, but the left-hand side, I darkened down. And I, with the um, rosemary dagger brush, I did some of the, uh, some branches in that kind of, uh, over the, the bush to the left of the, of the building. And I did a lot of spattering and it was, anyway, it, it happened very, very quickly. The, there was very little self-doubt in doing this painting. Um, and it, it felt like the textures I was getting reminded me of a photograph of a, of a, of an image I've been wanting to do. And I had found a family photograph that, uh, dealt with that, that I wanted to do. So the next slide, Betty Sue. This is the family photograph. These, this was our 1963 Valiant station wagon. That was a very nice car. We liked that car. The 1960 Valiant station wagon that immediately preceded this car had a bad habit that whenever you went through a puddle, the distributor cap got wet and you would, uh, you would, it would stall and mom or dad would make you get out of the car and you had to, then they'd pop the hood and you'd, take the distributor cap off, dry it off, and put it back, screw it back on. Um, but this Valiant did not do that. We liked this Valiant. And I don't know, I think as my brother Will probably took this photo, why he wanted to take a picture of the Valiant, but I'm glad that he did. But behind the Valiant are our barns on Emerson Road in Milford, New Hampshire. And I love those barns. You could injure yourself in so many creative ways in that in those barns. Um, the big barn, the, the one that's the, the Valiant is blocking, that, the big barn, that's where the chickens were. And that there was a swing, a rope swing, and there were nails sticking out of the floor. So you could just gouge the hell out of your foot if you weren't careful. But my brother, Graham told me that the red inner tube that hung on the wall in the big barn was out to get me. And my job in the late afternoon was to go collect the eggs for the day. And when Graham was around, he would say, can you hear it, Charles? It's hissing at you. And I would go in by myself into the big barn late in the day to pick up the eggs. And I could hear that inner tube hissing at me. It was terrifying. Next to the big barn was what we called the pig barn. And that is, that's right to the right of the right headlight of, or the left headlight of the, um, the Valiant's left headlight, the right headlight to us. But behind there is, that's the pig barn where the pigs lived. And that, the way that barn connected to the big barn is just kind of one of the graphic 
things that haunts me and the, the colors of that barn. So that first painting I did, the 20 by 20 of the abandoned schoolhouse, immediately led to, oh, I want to try to do a treatment of the pig barn that way. Um, and the, these barns also really informed me um, in my artistic practice, because when I was a kid, I was so happy. I loved those barns, I was so happy. And then the state of New Hampshire put a highway bypass around Milford, New Hampshire, and they nailed those barns, tore them down. And uh, that I, I was enraged by that in my, I carried childhood trauma about that around for a long time. And I think it's why I like to paint barns so much. Um, anyway, next slide, Betty Sue. So this is my source photo. This is the best I'm working from. So from that photo, I did this sketch. This is about a four inch by four inch sketch of the pig barn as I remembered it. So the big barn is to the left, and then we're looking directly at the pig barn. Now, the tree that is in there is fiction. It is fiction, ladies and gentlemen. Flip back, Betty Sue, to the previous slide. The reality was there's some maple trees on our lawn. Then there was Emerson Road. And then there was the barnyard. And then there are some trees behind the pig barn. But there was not a tree right in front of the pig barn. Now go forward again, Betty Sue. So this. I, but I wanted a vertical. It, it was too empty without a, I wanted the dark shadow and then blasting off into light on the right, but I needed a vertical as well because you got this super strong diagonal. So I had put the barn, I had put the tree in front of the barn, but then doing the same technique that I had done with the um, abandoned schoolhouse painting, I took another 20 by 20, did a pencil drawing, and next slide, Betty Sue. And I put the tree behind the barn, and that well, I like it much better. I like it much better. Um, so I was trying to tell as much of a story as I could with as little with as little paint as I could. And I'm quite happy with this painting except the shadow part of the barn seems to go up a little tiny bit. Wish it didn't do that, but can't be perfect. Um, now the shadow, I just, just in terms of technique, um, the shadow is Van Dyke Brown, just very thickly applied. So it retains that wonderful um, translucence. Hey, we have a visit from Charbonneau. Hey, Charbo, come on up. Oh. Sharbo did not want to come up, but he did want to just say hi briefly. Um, the roof line of the pig barn, I applied very wet paint and then just pulled it with the squeegee down. It gives that nice kind of corrugated look. My friend Doug Fryer says, we do not make things up. We invent and construct. I love the comment on fiction. Okay, well, Doug Fryer only speaks truth. I blather on. So whatever Doug says, you can trust. Anyway, um, the big barn, it's not a painting about the big barn. It's a painting about the pig barn. So the big barn is reduced to just that, that foreshortened dark shadow, right? And then light hitting the surface of the big barn. And then the tree behind, again, using the rosemary rigor, not the rosemary dagger brush to, to try to have as gestural uh, tree as possible. Anyway, I was quite happy with this one. So the abandoned schoolhouse and this, it's about three days apart that these two paintings come into existence and I wasn't even planning on it, you know. However, this got me thinking about barns and agriculture. And when I think about barns and agriculture, can I have the next slide, please, Betty Sue? When I think barns and agriculture, I think farmall tractors, which is strange because I do not have a history of farmalls in my family. In my family, that was Ford tractors were around. 
I never had a tractor, but um, there was there was a dead Ford tractor in one of the barns, and then the the fields behind us that were tilled was those little those little Ford Golden Jubilee tractors, which are just nice, tough looking tractors. But the Farmall tractor made by the International Harvester Company, that to me is just a beautiful bit of American uh, design. There was, the designer was Raymond Lowy, who had done the Broadway Limited for the Pennsylvania Railroad. He did, I believe he did the Electrolux canister vacuum cleaner. He did Studebaker. Um, and you'll see, you see, this is a utilitarian vehicle that they did just a tad of streamlined design. In 1939, the Raymond Lowy design of the, of the, the redesign of the farm all came out and it was a big hit. But these are tough. These are tough tractors. Uh, the Farmall H, you still see them today. And they're usually very battered. Um, the, the, there are some that are restored, but if you see a working one of these, they've, they've got a lot of dings, but they're still out there. So anyway, whenever I need source material, um, so doing the, doing the schoolhouse, which was the pesticide shed for the orchard, which led to doing the barn, led to me wanting to do a farm hall. So when I'm just going, just going, I go to Flickr and, you know, you just flip through photos until you find something you like. And then it's usually part of an album. And this, you know, it's like, you know, red tractors. And then there are 22,000 photographs of red tractors. You just flip through and flip through and flip through until you find something that you like. And I finally found this photograph. And uh, I don't know Randy Langstrat, um, but I sent him an email. So you can always send, you can contact people through Flickr. And I said, uh, I love the perspective that you got on this, uh, on this farm all. I would like to use it as source for a painting I'm gonna do. Uh, and I'd like to send you a hundred bucks and uh, I will send you a print of the, of the painting. The painting is not going to look like your photograph, but it is going to have the DNA of your photograph. And he wrote back saying, that sounds fine with me. Um, and I've done this a number with a number of photographers. If a photographer writes back and says, no, I don't want you to do that. Then of course I would not use that, that photograph. Um, but no photographer has done that yet. I think in general, people are really pleased to, that someone wants to generate from something from which they've, from their source material. So um, taking this photograph, I did a projection. And remember, I get to do projections because I do little sketching every day. So I know how to draw. You cannot just project without without knowing how to draw, because otherwise you'll end up with terrible projections. That's what I say, and I'm sticking to that. Next slide, please, Betty Sue. So this is my painting based on that photograph. Flip back again to the photo, A, and then here's the painting, B. So it does have the DNA of that photograph, but it is not that photograph. Um, the thing that I love about this, what really attracted me to the perspective of it was the light shining through the grill on the right hand side there. Um, I was not interested in the mechanics of the uh, engine itself. Flip back again, Betty Sue. You see underneath the, the sheet metal you know, the, the, the side of the engine block and the filters and stuff are very definite in this. But I'm not trying to do a portrait of the tractor itself. I'm trying to do a portrait of how, how these tractors feel to me. Back, move forward again, Betty Sue. So the tractor, I wanted it to be of the land. I wanted the 
the reddish, the red uh, paint to just kind of um, almost organically build out from the grays behind. And again, I did, uh, so I did a pencil drawing and then using those acrylic inks, did the underpainting in grays and then the reds are glazes with uh, the Cobra oils. Um, then there was some additional gray glazing, which I believe was a mixture of, uh, geez, probably Van Dyke Brown, Ultramarine and Titanium Buff. To, so I had dark, to do some dark gray shadows. Uh, like the tire over the, the big tire over on the right. I also very much wanted that row crop front end. That's the two tires together um, in the front. I wanted that to be of the earth. I wanted the, to 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 integrate the tractor to the land itself. And then in the background, just if if you don't have your Ettore six inch brass squeegee yet, ladies and gentlemen. You really should get one and experiment with it because that the tree line and the, the, the horizon line there is just, it literally took 45 seconds of loading the squeegee blade with paint, touching it to the surface and then hitting it slightly with a paper towel. Um, it really worth experimenting with. Really, it, it's such an amazing mark making tool. Anyway, so this was, so I've now done three 20 by 20s in the space of about a week where I, where I, I had not been, I had been shopping for um, scarves along with Alejandro as it were. And then all of a sudden I've got three complete paintings that really feel of a piece. And then I'm wandering around my studio because you kind of come off of that, you're in the zone during that five day period, right? You're in the zone, you kind of come out of the zone. So I couldn't, it's not like I could do another one of these. I just didn't feel like, oh, where does this take me now? Maybe it for someone else, they would have said, oh, the tractor germinates the idea of this and then but I wasn't having that. I was like, well, I'm at the end of that, that little chain of creativity. And I was looking around the studio and I've got a, I've got two boxes of dead paintings of junkers. Um, next slide, Betty Sue. And I looked into one, one of the boxes of junk paintings and here's a 20 by 20 that I did in 2012 of a house in Saxons River, Vermont. It's a plein air painting. I never, I liked it. I liked this painting, but it has never gotten one bit of notice when uh, people, when, you know, gallerists have come by my studio or anything. It just, it, it has never seemed to belong to anything. <laughs> I looked at it, it's, it's the same colors as what I've been doing. It's the same size as what I've been doing. And so all of a sudden, I don't have a suite of three photographs, I mean, of three paintings. I've got four paintings. I, mean, I just have to put the same frame on all four, and everybody's going to think I had that idea all along. It was remarkable, ladies and gentlemen. It was remarkable. But what I'm sharing this with you is is the idea of maybe you do something that has a resonance for you and it doesn't seem to have a resonance for anybody else don't paint over it keep it around and maybe something else you do at another time it will find its own resonance you know now as it turns out all, all four of these paintings are now at the framers. I'm having custom frames done on all four. But the Buffalo Bill Art Show and Sale out in Cody, Wyoming, which is one of my favorite events. People are crazy as can be in Wyoming, ladies and gentlemen. The, the, the 
Buffalo Bill Center for the West says, visible firearms must be checked at the desk. So I guess you can have concealed carry, but you can't have open carry. That's typical of Wyoming. But the people are, you know, it's, it's like the anti-Vermont. In Vermont, we're all dirt-eating liberals. Out there, they're all rabid right-wingers. Get along great with them. Wonderful people. But the Buffalo Bell Art Show and Sale is in Cody. And it is, it's a wonderful event. Um, has a live auction. So let's put the put the tractor back up. Oh, just have me. That's fine. We don't need the tractor back up, Betty Sue. Just put me big. Oh, we've got the tractor. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, Betty Sue. Um, anyway, so this is going to be my live auction piece for the Buffalo Bill Art Show and Sale because they saw it and they said, we would like that piece. I said, it's only 20 by 20 because normally big paintings is, is what uh, sells there. And they said, we think all our collectors have filled up all their big spaces. So a 20 by 20 would be really good. Um, so this will be out there in September. So my my four, four tip, um quadruptic is now back down to a triptych. But it was just, uh, even though I did, what was it? Uh, 21 pieces in March. And in May, I've only done three pieces. It has been a really exhilarating um, little little the last the last week ten days. Now you can do me big, Betty Sue. So it it I just wanted to share with you how disorganized and how uncalculated. Um, the creative process is and it can drive us nuts and we wish to be judgmental about it but i think it can often lead to a really good uh to a really good outcome if we just if we get out of our own way and let us be as irritating and trivial and disorganized as we tend to like to be one thing before i go um i am only doing i think i've got two workshops this year um and one of them the one outside of chicago is sold out um there is space in the at the one in michigan in holland michigan so if you go to 100-studio.com go to workshops if you're interested in taking a workshop uh go go to the workshops tab and it's got the uh link to the franciscan life process center in Holland, Michigan, uh, and we're going to have us a good time. And if you'd like to, if you'd like to take a workshop, we'd like to see you. That'll be in August. All right, I think that's everything for this week. I hope that was interesting, ladies and gentlemen. You take good care. There will not be a reasonably fine art talk next week. I will be on the road in Arizona uh, at at a music event that I'm uh, helping organize. And Betty Sue will be there. And then Betty Sue and I are taking the train back across the country. And we get back on, what, the Sunday the 23rd? Uh, and then there will be. We will be back to doing the Reasonably Fine Art Talk after that. Anyway, thanks so much for joining us. You take good care. And we'll see you in two weeks. Bye-bye.